Hi, this is Polly with Get Busy Thriving. I'm really excited to bring you this interview with Virginia Merrim. Hello. Hi. And Virginia has actually been my personal chef for years and, and more, friend and personal chef. And what she and I have decided that we wanted to get together and talk about because um, I received an, a, a text from a client that I'll share with you. And we had some conversation about this. We said, we need to like get this on video. So a client sent me a message and said, I want to learn what it would be like to have a healthy, normal, peaceful, easy relationship with food. And don't we all, right? <laughs> so we said, why don't we do a session and talk about, you know, how to eat or think like a normal eater, learning to have a healthy, nourishing relationship with food, right? Yeah. And so my background is eating disorders and you and I've known each other for a long time now and, you know, we come to find out that you had an eating disorder. So maybe start with that. Tell me a little bit about your journey, some of your experience with eating disorders and how it led you to maybe today. Absolutely. So, you know, the text message speaks really closely to me um, because this idea that we need to, to fix or to heal our relationship with food is what led me to become a chef. Mm. Um, you know, it was interesting because you and I have known each other for a long time and it wasn't even until recently that we even delved into the fact that I had years of eating disorders. Right, right. So it's, you know, it's for me that is that is a story that is my past mm -hmm. and it's part of the stepping stone to how I now love food. And right. in fact, I love food so much it's become the center of my career. So, uh, you know, my eating disorders, and I, I put an S on there because they evolved and they were multiple, um, <laughs> maybe has a similar story to everyone's. It started mm -hmm. off with a um, with a voice or a philosophy from my mom at mm -hmm. a young age. I didn't fit the body type of my siblings or of what she expected. Went to doctor initiated, you know, putting me on restricted mm -hmm. caloric diet, uh, diets when I was very young. Wow. You know, and sometimes we look back at it and it's almost unfathomable. Like, right. like really? Like you put me on a liquid diet at wow. age nine? Wow. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing to yeah. the diet pills, to all the different diets. And so for many years, those eating disorders were justified. Hmm. Oh, there because, was, there was like the doctor had or, or someone yeah had, or know. or this is a good thing that you know the weight loss needs to happen or we support it or we yeah. see it and it was based on that the physical appearance your outward aesthetics. appearance wasn't yes. acceptable or, yeah. or it needs to change and so therefore it was okay like uh, when I was little I was called Jenny so Jenny can deny her food because or she doesn't need to have dessert because we're all in this this unit supporting her. the weight loss mm. um, that later developed into a system of praise. Mm -hmm. So it became, if weight was dropped, you received parental or maternal right. praise, you received right. compliments, you received, it became a uh, internal and external competition. Feeding that need for love, right? right? Oh, like absolutely. We all have that inherent need for love and connection. If we do right by mom or, you know, what the, our parents say, we get that love and connection. Like yeah. what child wouldn't, you know, start to learn that reward system? Yeah, and, and it, then it led to um, almost uh, an obsessive need to control the surrounding, mm. which is uh, you least, or your mom. Like, um, I think both, but for me, yeah. it became you know when things are out of control in your external environment, the easiest thing to control is what you put in your, mouth. You put in your mouth, and it gave or you, seemingly right. Yeah, <laughs> seemingly, and then it, then seemingly, it gets a little out of control. <laughs> and then it it really made you feel as if somehow you were um, there was something in your life that you could that you could predict or not predict if not eating this and the weight loss combined with it. And as many of us who have undergone eating disorders come to realize is that eventually the metabolism in the body betray us right. because it's, it's trying to save us. And right. then what was predictable becomes unpredictable. Right. And then you start extreme, more extreme behaviors right. to figure out how and to- And the body goes into- <laughs> goes into shock mode. It goes into deprivation mode. Yeah. And you're trying to find those routes. So it went from, what was hidden and maintained to becoming so extreme that then that same unit, that same family unit, um, became angry with me. Mm. And I can remember so vividly to mm. some specific moments in my life that I felt um, can, so confused because I would have moments where my, uh, I went from not eating anything to binge eating, so much so that it was evident to my family that well, what's happening? Why is she shoving six brownies down 
but then not gaining weight. And so mm-hmm. at the time, my, my older brother caught me mm-hmm. um, throwing up mm-hmm. and he ran downstairs and told my mom and mm-hmm. my mom, you know, it turned into anger. It turned into this, I will not have this. I'm not going to put somebody in the not hospital. Acceptable. Not acceptable. How dare you do this? Just stop eating all those brownies to begin with. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was surprising and shocking. And Um, we went through those moments and so then it became more reclusive eating disorder. It became, I'm going to hide it more. And ironically, the easiest way to do this was to start following crazy diet and medical trend. So this was right in the early nineties when Atkins diet became really popular and Atkins diet was this cure all and it's what I call a diet cult. And it became easy to say, oh no, I'm just, I would pile up those books on the side and I'd say, oh no, I'm just following the Atkins diet. And it was so supported. Yeah. Oprah was talking about it. Everyone was talking about it. So as long as I was following what... And, and you're like, I need a strategy. You know, I need to, these guys must know it, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so it went from that to then all of a sudden, um, at about uh, 17, um, deciding I was going to become a vegetarian. Mm-hmm. And I was going to become a vegetarian because I, I had a lot of philosophy about um, the reasons behind it. And I, for many years, abused that reasoning because I could go to restaurants and I could full blown deny mm. anything on the menu wow. and say, well, they cook on a grill that uses animal fat. So I could sit there and not eat in front of everybody because okay. of, because of this system. A moral reason, but it was more, you know, some backwards thinking. Yeah. It seems like, yeah. Yeah. It was, well, I don't really trust what's in that. So they tell me it's artichoke dip, but I'm going to go ahead and, cause they, they might have cooked, you know, it became a, it became a very, a, yeah, a very and isolating, I bet too. Right? I mean, like, and strangely empowering though, mm-hmm. right? Because you could be that person who could say no and everybody go, well, that makes sense because, you know, I mean, it, she's on the Atkins diet or she is right. a vegetarian and it just cascaded into one thing versus the other. And mm-hmm. ironically, it all kind of collapsed in college. I was getting my degree in art history and, um, and art. Um, and I was working as a research assistant and I was, uh, working too many jobs and obviously mm-hmm. there was a little bit of that uh, competition and need for control was kicking into all aspects of my life mm-hmm. and I formed really insane insomnia mm-hmm. and I now understand the the actual physical reasons behind it and what was happening to my metabolism and my body right. during this time but the insomnia was so severe that I had to check myself into the hospital mm-hmm. and as I sat there with the doctor who was a part of the women's wellness center, she kept talking about my diet mm. and I kept getting more and more defensive and mm. thought, I, can you just give me she some She was just asking pills? for like what they, what it was or? Well, she was asking, you know, what did you eat today? Like what, how much water have you had? Where's your food intake? And I just remember thinking, what is wrong with this woman? <laughs> like, give me the sleeping pills yeah. so I can go to sleep and mm. move on. And you keep asking me about my diet. Mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. want to talk to you about my food. Mm-hmm. That's not any, it has nothing to do with it. Right? Yeah, it has nothing right. to do with anything. Like, it's none of your business. And right. we sat there and she said, I'm actually not going to give you any sleeping pills. And I was just, I mean, the anger was so severe. And she said, but I am going to ask you a question. Why do you hate food so much? Mm. And I stood up and I said, I, I don't know what you're talking. I just remember it was this like indignation and I stormed out of there. Your beliefs were left. so strong. They it's were so like strong. It was running the show. And, wow. and years later, um, I got really sick. I got um, lots of things happened. And, and later we knew that it was chemical tolerance and a bunch of things combined to my system falling apart. I lost a, almost all of my hair. Oh. I had welts all over my body. And this was in my early 20s. Um, my thyroid basically completely stopped. Oh. And I went into the emergency room one morning, I woke up and I had just clumps of hair all over my pillow. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, all the process still trying to be on these different diets, right? Yeah, Yeah, you know, I was on, yeah, I was on lots of different, um, I think I was doing raw veganism at that time in Los Angeles and I um, woke up and I had full clumps. And I think you said like soy, you know, you were, oh, soy, yeah. The toxicity or, you know, like too much. Too much of, well, it was a lot of processed soy. Mm -hmm. Um, They found out that I had a, a really bad allergy to soy. So here I was, consuming lots of Boca burgers and doing all these um, soy based so yeah, health foods. And I checked into Cedar sinai and out of, you know, the grace of the universe, um, there was actually a dermatologist on call. Oh. And he came in and said, do me a favor, here's my personal card, huh. 
why don't you just come to my office and have a conversation with me? And I thought, this is so random. Why would I go to a dermatologist's <laughs> office for like what's happening with me? Huh. So we sat in his office and he said, I don't want to examine you. I just want to talk to you about a few things. Mm. On this piece of paper, would you write down everything that you've eaten today? And I had such a flashback to the doctor from the, the in college. Yeah. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> that has nothing what? to do yes. with this. <laughs> I do yoga. I'm running. I eat a raw vegan diet. Like, what's like, what's wrong with you people? Right. And he said, I'm gonna throw it out there and and sort of make a suggestion. I think everything comes down to your completely messed up relationship with food. Oof. And I thought, really? He goes, I think you have no idea what food is and what purpose food serves. And at this time I was working at the LA County Museum. I was on a route to become a curator. Like that was my life dream. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'd like you to look at this program out of Portland called Nutritional Therapy. And Nutritional Therapy is looking at food and the function that food serves. Mm -hmm. And you study a hundred different diets and all the diets that have been promoted um, in the world for supposed health and which ones actually works and which ones don't. Mm -hmm. So he said, they have a list of books. You don't actually have to do the program, but I'd like you to look into it. And I'd like you to look into the fact that nothing that's on this list of foods you eat is actual food. It means the one that you wrote that you that wrote down. <laughs> said everything on here is a product. Everything oh. is fake. Everything is processed. Wow. Everything is is yeah, it's not live. You it's know, not, yeah, it's yeah. not food. And wow. I was like, what is this man talking about? And, and to know you today, <laughs> and to think like this is how you're thinking, I'm like, what? What are you saying? <laughs> and what would happen was, is as I would start to learn, and I'd read these books, some great ones, In Defense of Food by Michael mm -hmm. Pollan, um, Omnivore's Dilemma, um, and as I would like go through these books and go, wait, I need to actually look at these Boca Burgers, and I need to look at this Veganaise, and I need to look at this packaged and what's on the back is this even an ingredient like is this food mm -hmm. and it became wow. a very bizarre challenge because I realized wait I can't even have teriyaki sauce I can't even have mayonnaise I can't mm -hmm. and I went back to him and I said I hear you but I'm still not sure how this is going to make my hair grow back <laughs> right like I was wearing wigs and I wore wraps I said I still don't understand and he said well you're just going to have to learn how to make those foods yourself mm. And I thought, well, that's impossible. Like, mm -hmm. how does somebody make mayonnaise? And he laughed and said, well, mayonnaise has been around for a long time. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, someone made it to begin with. Bread's been around for a long time. It's wow. not like yeah. it requires industry to make this bread. And wow. as that process happened, it was this amazing unraveling of myself because I would have to go in the kitchen and I'd have to make food figure it out and yeah. i had to touch it and i had to transform um, it and i had to appreciate it and i had to come up with ways in which i had to physically mm. bond with the thing mm. that i had had such a hate towards mm. and you didn't notice that you had the hatred towards it they did yes exactly so you were like why am i doing this yeah right? why am i doing this mm. and it was but we're still eating six brownies and, and getting rid of them, or was that... Oh, no, at this point, I had become a... I got my certifications in um, occupational therapy and biomechanics, so the way that I justified everything was working out like two and a half hours a day. <laughs> so instead, I was on a very restricted God, so... diet, but I, you know, I just made sure to do like three spin classes a day, because that was justified in my now... Got it. Air, right. So as long as, you know, you go to the gym and you're a trainer, work it all you off. working off for, out for two hours isn't abnormal. Right. Right. You doing weight training twice a day is what you do because that's your occupation. Right. Like, so therefore getting really, really lean was actually praised by all of the trainers. More praised for getting, looking a certain way. Yeah. Right? It was, it was, yeah. you know, it's, it's okay that you're doing this because look at how great you look. And, and everybody good. else here is looking up to you for it. Yeah, yeah. and before and afters and all the things. Yeah, it was, it was that was that industry fully supported it. Right. Like, oh no, I understand you wanted to go take another spin class. That makes sense. You you have clients, so you got to maintain that look based on your clientele. Yeah. Um, so I'm doing go, all this weird stuff over here for food, <laughs> you know, yeah. weird stuff in the gym or overdoing it in the gym strangely doing it in the kitchen yeah wow, okay so it was uh, i say um there was a lot of arguments between me and food there was lots <laughs> of me being in the kitchen and griping and mumbling and huh. that relationship no longer served what it used to it no longer served i'm feeling bad i'm just going to run in the store and grab those chips and shove it down and mm -hmm. then purge it because i felt guilt mm -hmm. it was no longer um 
indulgence. It was no longer those treats. It was, I was supposed to be making something that was going to serve a purpose for me. And the word that kept getting used by the doctor was to heal me. Mm -hmm. Like that food, that's what it needed to do. I needed to be eating stuff that was going to be helping me, not harming me. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like if there was a camera in those kitchens, I, I can remember so vividly back to my condo in Los Angeles. And I feel like if people actually heard the conversations <laughs> that I had with my food and they right. at the same time launched into another bizarre aspect of my life, which I decided that if I went into yoga, um, somehow that would then justify my extreme athleticism based on the spirituality realm. Um, <laughs> so I decided I was going to get yoga certified and become a yoga teacher and, yeah. um, it, you know, because there's nothing like doing 400 hours of yoga and I'm like, and justify it because I was going to be certified for it. Wow. Um, and interestingly, I took a class with a guy who, um, it was, it was nothing like I ever expected. We went to go do our yoga certification and he played dirty rap music the whole time in our yoga class. Huh. And I was mad. Like mad was, <laughs> I was really pissed off. Yeah. And I was like, no, I, I need the candles. Mm -hmm. I need the spiritual incense, the spir and yeah, yeah. feminine. But yeah. instead, I'm hearing every curse word out of the book and <laughs> things that I don't want to listen to. And it was like I was angry and upset and mm -hmm. getting more and more mad at him. Mm -hmm. And he kept saying, this is the whole point. Mm -hmm. Yoga is what you do in your everyday. Yoga is what you do mm -hmm. anytime you feel frustrated. Yoga is what you do anytime you have anger towards something. Mm -hmm. That's... The practice. That's the practice. Mm. And you're going to sit here and you're going to listen to this. And I'm going to turn it up louder until all of you can handle being in so L.A. traffic. And be, be, and be fine. Be a yogi. Yeah, yeah be yeah. a yogi. Yeah. It was a really tough three and a half hours. Wow. And, yeah. <laughs> and, but what happened was that night I remember walking to my kitchen and going, oh, the food, oh. the chopping, the effort, the dishwashing, cleaning, the failures, mm. the burning, like, mm -hmm. that's where I was supposed to heal that relationship was with the food itself. Mm -hmm. And through that, it developed my passion and my drive towards the beauty of eating and cooking. Because who I know you are today is not any of what you Not any said. of that. I mean, you've clearly healed it because you so speak now and, and not preach now, but you so share now about your abundant love for it and how it's healing and nourishing. And that's... That's what we want to, you know, cover today. Yeah. Mostly because, you know, anyone listening to this, if you had the same kind of desire that my client did, it's like I want to have a healthy, normal, peaceful. I, I know you to have that right now. Yeah. So let's talk a little about. Um, I have a question here. So give us some examples of what you notice when you hear someone with disordered eating thoughts or behavior. So if you hear it in a client or you hear it out in public or just someone on the street, what what signals do you like you? It sounds like you've healed all of that. You yeah. Know, you have this beautiful relationship with food. You work around it all day long. You know, it's funny. I would think about somebody um, with, you know, eating disorder or bulimia, anorexia or whatever. Like, just being around food as often as you are would be very triggering if they yeah. weren't as, com like you said, you've, you've healed it. So, yeah. what do you hear, what do you notice when someone has disordered eating thoughts or behavior? It's always fear. Mm. Um, there is a very, you know, um, one of my favorite acronyms of fear is false expectations appearing real. Okay. And it's an idea that something is going to create something that doesn't actually exist. Mm. So I, I see it in, you know, I call it, um, in my current book that I'm writing, it's, you know, all these different, um, diet supported fears. So mm. the fear of fat, the fear of carbohydrates right now, we have a huge one with the keto diet. Mm. Um, it's. It's people being afraid that it might create an autoimmune disorder. It might, I hear worry. Um, mm. And usually from a bystander, it's quite innocent. And people will say, well, no, but I mean, I get that, right? Because I mean, gluten can be really bad for you. But I hear this such a fear that they're afraid to touch or to, to eat or to even, you know, the, the list that I receive. Now, are you absolutely positive? I'm not celiac, but are you absolutely positive there's no gluten in your kitchen? Mm. You know, it becomes, um, it becomes a, an obsession based on, on, I want to say medical necessity for people that I realize that they are, you know, they're so afraid of what they're eating. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, again, it's that justification of somehow that I, I saw in myself that, you know, when I was sitting at the restaurant in the menu, mm -hmm. but I'm seeing it now as 
I took this all cat and it told me the 29 foods that I can't eat. Mm. So now I'm not going to eat anything because they might have rosemary in it. Mm. And it's, mm. it's an interesting, um, so the, the fear, I mean, it's, I, I don't feel. So kind of, that sounds like lots of rules, you know? So like, Oh, I don't eat like the laundry list of things that they, they avoid or they don't eat or, and it sounds like with you in the preparation, they're concerned that you might prepare something that they couldn't eat. And that it's what I've come to realize that in some of our extreme cases of eating disorders, um, where it's so evident, right? Extreme mm -hmm. weight loss or, um, or sickness or illness, that I began to realize that I was surrounded by so many people who had this broken relationship. Mm -hmm. um, that the broken relationship was above and beyond just those with supposed eating disorders that we mm -hmm. had. I saw it amongst young kids refusing to eat food and and parents you know I, I always say the same thing is you've got the person with the the bagel and the latte and their cell phone driving the car and eating yeah. their relationship with food is so broken that they don't realize that food is supposed to be sat down and savored mm -hmm. and enjoyed mm -hmm. and oftentimes when I ask people how do they eat their food and they say things like I mean I don't really know and it's just a chore or something I just need to get done or mm -hmm. I need to it just like needs check to it off my check list. Check off like, my list. Yeah. yeah, or those people who like forget to eat. You know, like it's not even a part of their paradigm enough that nourishing their body and the energy that it needs to be high functioning. You know, the the power that the brain needs to to think properly. To eat breakfast food, right? I'll just have my coffee and I'll be good. And you think, well, what's the caloric intake? That's our energy. That's all calories mm -hmm. are. They get us from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose of food. You know, and I find too um, that people don't understand. Like I, and I look at my former relationships with food, both from junk food, you know, being raised with parents that were into mac and cheese and, you know, kids, yeah. but mac and cheese and hot dogs and not that any of that is inherently wrong, but the, the way that I saw my body, I didn't realize it was like, like a, like a filter, like a processing unit, you know, and my body is actually taking nutrient out of what I eat. And I just look at it like, like a, like a trash, you know, almost like yeah. a garbage disposal. It's like, oh, just put it in, you know? And, and I think we don't realize how we can kind of pollute it as well. Right? Yeah. You talked about the toxins that you were eating. and, and Well, eating serves only two purposes. One mm -hmm. is to absorb and the other is to excrete. Mm -hmm. If either one of those systems are broken, there's a problem. Right. If you're not pushing it out and if you're not consuming it in the appropriate manner, then it's a broken it system. Up. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, that's the only reason why we consume food mm -hmm. and we forget that just like air or water or sex or sleep or touch there are certain things that we depend on as humans in order to thrive right and we've we've broken this relationship so much so that we get it with young infants mm -hmm. and we call it failure to thrive mm -hmm. when they're not eating a doctor uh -huh. will say they're failure to thrive right as we get older, it becomes justified and okay. Right. And it's interesting because when you deal with like hospice nurses, they will actually remind you that someone's at the end of their life when they stop consuming calories. Because mm. you're literally giving that loop and that feedback to your brain your body is saying that you don't need calories right. anymore. Right. And that process of deprivation, um, and, and deprivation can happen in the junk food, yes. right? So if you have food that is void of nutrients right. that your body needs, the basic minerals and, the, and macronutrients as well mm -hmm. um, from, from fat and carbohydrates and glucose. And right now we do have a huge fear of glucose in our society um, and we need it. Our brain can't function without it. That's why we have so much brain fog. You know, there's all these <laughs> philosophies about adrenal fatigue and ironically, we see a lot of memory loss simply from people denying themselves glucose. Um, so we forget that the macronutrients and those micronutrients is how every cellular function in our body right. succeeds. And the irony of the whole story is that the, the systems function most when we actually use the food in its proper form. So when we savor the food and we enjoy the food and we have thankfulness for the food, our metabolism actually fires at a better rate mm. so we can use the calories in all of our systems. Mm. The beneficial bacteria in our, our gut actually works to produce serotonin and dopamine mm. as well as all the other hormones we need and, and oxytocin as well. Right. Um, so it's, it's that function happens from, from chewing. It's, you know, we laugh and say, that's why you chew your food 20 times, right? But mastication actually it helps. helps that process. Right. So when we're um, liquid diets, big one, right? That deprive mm -hmm. it. So it's, that system of knowing what food serves and the purpose of food 
that allows us to use it. And, you know, my husband is now going for his doctor of chiropractic and functional medicine, but was a personal trainer for years. And the most common question that he gets asked is, how do I lose weight? Mm. And he always says the same thing to, to thoroughly piss off. You know, when somebody has an eating disorder, when they ask that and he responds with this and they get mad, is he says, you know, weight is just a symptom. Mm. And that's all that is. Weight gain or weight loss is just a symptom of something. And they're like, well, no, 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 I just need to know how to lose the weight. It's right. like, well, weight has nothing to do with anything. If you're gaining weight, it's because your body is no longer functioning. Mm -hmm. And fat serves a really important purpose, which is it protects the cellular membranes mm -hmm. from toxins. Right. So if we're not excreting toxins out of our body, our cells actually pad themselves with fat mm -hmm. to prevent the toxins from entering into the cellular membrane. It's why we see in menopause women get it between the thighs, belly, all the places where the lymph nodes sit huh. is to protect ourselves. Wow. So if you are gaining weight, it's because your body is doing what it's supposed to do. Mm. And he'll always say the same thing. Be thankful. Your body is doing what it's supposed to do. Mm. You're eating a lot of toxins and it's protecting you from getting sick. Mm. Not really what people want to hear. But look at the root. It's kind of like when you went to that doctor and you said, I just want to get my hair back. I don't need to pay attention to my food. And he's like, yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, you got, yeah, like, what's the, what they're, is the they're root? Cor they're correlated. They're yeah. very correlated. Yeah. And so, again, it's you put the food in your mouth and it provides you nourishment. And I never mm -hmm. say nutrients because I think that word got... Tangled with vitamins and, and calories. And devolved and, 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 mm. and health. And I call them diet cults. They're these things that are used to so sell food as a product. When mm. food isn't a product, mm. food is something that's freely provided to us from the earth. This is not something that we as humans created. We did not create food. <laughs> right. um, the universe made sure it was here for us as humans. <laughs> um, but for some reason, we think that we are right. the, you know, the ones in charge of it. And so it provides us with nourishment, meaning that it provides us with the ability to do all those things in life that we need to do. Yeah. So if I want to get up and I want to run, I want to get up and I want to climb a mountain, if I want to get up and I want to go have a peaceful conversation, if I want to get up and I want to go read, whatever it is that I'm doing during my day to get up and achieve, to thrive, mm -hmm. I need that nourishment in order for that to happen. Mm -hmm. I can't do it without it. I can't do it without air. There's only thing. I can't do it without water. You right. got to be able to do that. Right. And then the secondary part, which is the part that really created that that final bridge for me was the joy aspect mm. because I was told so long that food wasn't a treat mm. that food wasn't a reward system mm. that that's why I had had my eating disorders to begin with that I would watch especially in movies you know you, you see current movies like Eat Pray Love or you see um, Julia or Julie Julia and you see Chocolat and there's this it's not indulgence. It's like truly being in love with their food, mm. right? It's that numbing quality. It's that loving what they eat. Right. And that food does have the ability for us to feel joy. And it was really hard for me to, to get that until I became a chef because I began to cook food that tastes so good that inherently it you would numb while you good. ate it. Yes. Oh. And then I remember I was eating salmon bruschetta and I was at my table, and I was actually like, oh my gosh, this is so good. <laughs> and it cued in my brain, remembering seeing little babies nurse. Mm -hmm. And when they nurse, they make this noise, and they go, num, 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 num. Mm -hmm. And it's such an interesting thing to watch a baby do that while they're nursing. And I began to research the reason behind that. Like, mm -hmm. what is that noise that they make? Right, right. It's right, like, like cats purring is what it reminds me of for yeah. some reason. And like, they eat, and they make this, this numbing sound. And it was interesting because that is a feedback loop, a neurological mm. feedback loop that allows our metabolism to fire. Interesting. And it actually sends <clears throat> off a certain chemical in our brain huh. that allows us, um, that it, it feeds our beneficial bacteria, but it allows us to use our calories appropriately. It's what mm. makes our metabolic set rate. Wow. And what was so interesting was this, as I was reading about this and I was like, huh, and they're talking about this vibration that happens in the jaw and it happens in the nasal passage of this numbing. All of a sudden I said, oh my gosh, that's what umming is. Oh. When we um in yoga, hmm. it's the same thing. And I started researching the power of umming and what it does to the neurological, and I thought, oh, we are, yoga is in the kitchen. Hmm. We're supposed to numb wow. while we eat, wow. but it's not fun to numb while you're eating Lay's potato chips. Right. You gotta have something that's really yeah. good and yeah. something that brings you true, like that 
there's this art form to it. And, and mm. it, ironically, that's why I became a chef because there's nothing more magical than the transformation of food and then actually tasting it and mm. being like, um, and I don't know if you saw my video from last night. So we had a, a Christmas dinner last night and we made all these different uh, real food uh, desserts. And so we made chocolate mousse from scratch and it was just super fun. And we do everything without the, you know, how did they used to do it? Right. That's what right. basically That's what my I company know. became you about. Like, sourdough from yeah, scratch. Yeah, come back that. from how we used to do it so we don't have to put all that crap in it. Yeah. And so I was videotaping because for whatever reason, the joy at my table was so out of control. It was hysterical. <laughs> like, it became almost so silly. Oh. So I brought up my camera just to get a, you know, just to a capture it. And I posted it on Facebook because there's this hysterical scene where... I loop back to my husband and he's trimming the pie and he's laughingly going, I'm just trimming it. And he starts to eat it out of there and <laughs> complete reflex, he drools. Oh. And I'm like, you just drooled on the pie. <laughs> and he's like, I can't help it. And I thought that was true mm, enjoyment, enjoyment, but there's no guilt there. There's right. no guilt because what you're eating is nourishing. You guys have the alignment of you know, mind and body that you take it in and the body assimilates it and all of that. Yeah. And and this, it, and there's none of the chemicals or the fear in it. We're eating real food and yeah. real food that nourishes us. Let's, because you said a little earlier, and I want to touch upon this about the restriction. You know, so where does the res either you know where did it come from, or why do we think that that's the answer? Because I, I can tell you, anyone watching this that's thought diet, been on a diet, tried diets, wants to lose weight, the thing that we think about is restriction. And is that something that's just handed down, or is that is, is that really how you should do it? Is there, is there like an instinctual function of restriction? Yeah. Um, you know, humans are interesting because we do function on both um, famine and feast. Hmm. Um, seasonally, we see it in the way that food um, is harvested, the way that food grows, food goes dormant, that we do have, um, that we do have on seasons and we do have off seasons. Hmm. Um, and there's actually nothing wrong with it. In fact, we see a lot of benefits to intermittent fasting. Hmm. So um, ironically, it's not what some of us with eating disorders considers, even that word can right. be triggering, right? right? Like right. It's, it's really interesting. It is a practice. Uh, uh, yeah, it can be very um, triggering. But you know, I tell people the most, uh, that the most successful intermittent fasting is just not eating after the sun goes down mm. because we don't need it as humans. As mm. humans, we go as into energy, our cave. Yeah, yeah our energy. Yeah. We're not right. using those. Like, why sit and eat right. crackers and cheese and drink wine and then sit in bed and watch a movie? Like, right. your body, it literally messes up your cortisol. Your body has no idea why you have that th that mm. 800 calories. Mm. Like, what are you doing with this? It's just going to store it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's um, so we do know that instinctually there is there are seasons. Okay. And what has happened is we are we are so inundated with excess, mm -hmm. and we are so sold what we have to have, and we're so sold um, three meals a day and, we're, and snacks in between, and this much and that much, and if you do it this way, you'll achieve this before and after. And I always call it the six pack syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. If you just follow this completely, you'll look like this and you'll get this. That we've completely tuned out of our instincts, mm -hmm. and I see it with young kids so often with parents and. And the forcing of behavior right. towards eating. Right. Eat right. your food. You know, you know everything. Clear your plate, plate and... or you'll get dessert if you eat this. <clears throat> right. And or if you don't want that, at least just take two bites of this. And we we override it. You know, and the the science of picky eating is very complicated um, because we have problem eaters and we have picky eaters, um, and we tune out of that instinct so much that I don't meet a lot of people mm -hmm. who can say to themselves, "Am I hungry?" Mm -hmm. Am I really hungry right now? And do I really need to eat this? Right. Most of the time, it's the it's the feedback of I shouldn't be eating that. Mm. I don't need to eat it's that. It's not time. It's not time, mm. or that would be bad of me to eat that. Mm. And what happens is when we deprive ourselves, our um, our cortisol shoots up, mm. and it's flight fight. Mm -hmm. So it's the tiger chasing us. Mm -hmm. And when our cortisol shoots up, we have a choice. Mm. Our adrenaline can shoot up to meet it, mm -hmm. and that means that then we can go run. And I tell people when you're running and you're running, eventually the tiger's gonna win. Tiger's a lot faster than you, it can go a lot longer. Right. Or it can shoot up, and typically testosterone can come to meet it, mm -hmm. and you can fight. Mm -hmm. And you can fight that, and you can, you can like, succeed. Like fight against the. Fight against it, mm -hmm. and your cortisol drops. Mm -hmm. So when we go through deprivation, our cortisol spikes, and typically, especially in women, 
we don't have that need to fight, right? Like we deprive ourselves and we are like, you know what? This is how I'm feeling. I'm gonna do this. Instead, we're like, we get that feedback of adrenaline, like, okay, I feel good, mm -hmm. right? I got adrenaline pumping, adrenaline's taking over, mm -hmm. and we go and we go and we go, and eventually it completely depletes itself. Is that like busyness? Is that what yeah, you mean? Pretty yeah, much yeah, so, yeah. Like doing, racing, doing, yeah, doing, 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 yeah. doing. Yeah. And that's actually what we refer to a lot as adrenal fatigue, mm -hmm. is that constant need. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, so it's tied to the depriving. The depriving. So, so we deprive ourselves and then we go, go, go based on fake calories or yeah. a fake energy source, if you fake will. Fake energy source. Yeah. And eventually it becomes a feedback that we, it's like self-punishment. Mm -hmm. That there's a, there's a sense of energy expansion based in deprivation. Mm -hmm. And it's really, it's, a, it's not a simple thing to heal mm -hmm. until you can put that food in your mouth and say, what am I doing with this today? Am I am I choosing to to live? Am I choosing to thrive? Right. What am I? What great thing am I going to achieve with these with, calories? You know, it's interesting you say that. And when I think about something we talked about off camera was, you know, we feed ourselves after something like, oh, I'll go treat myself because I ran or I hiked or I did some something. You finished a paper, yeah. You know, whatever, right? And instead, the way food is to be used is feed the body so that you can do that thing instead Absolutely. of reward yourself afterward for having done that. Thing. Yeah, like I'll take this spin class so that I can eat tonight. Right. It It's a backwards, that's not how food gets used. You right. eat so that you can take the spin class. Right, right. Because um, your body doesn't, like, it doesn't use the calories in the past. Yeah, you know, it's not like, ever, like, ever, ever, it's, it's, never, it's, yeah. it's not, it's not like a yeah. bank account or, you know, or credit card <laughs> or something. It's like, let me take a withdrawal now and then I'll fill it up later. Which is why we've always known breakfast is the most important meal of the day. You it know, starts off that it starts off the day. It's yeah. what gets your, your energy going. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, I, I didn't even know this was a thing until I moved seven years ago here is, um, is drunkorexia. Hmm. Um, and I feel like we maybe have talked about it, but I was oh. so surprised to find out I had some people who work at the local university explaining to me that it was a new diagnosis. Huh. Um, because what would happen is you have young, primarily amongst young college girls, um, save up calories during the day by not eating in order to be able to drink more. Got it. And so it's actually deemed drunkorexia. Hmm. And I remember when I heard about it, I wanted to laugh at first because I thought, there's no way. <laughs> How could there's you no, think? Yeah, there's no way that like you're not eating food so that you can have 800 it's, calories right. at the end of the night. Right. Because my relationship had healed so much that to me I thought, just well, what are you doing with those 800 calories? <laughs> Besides getting really drunk and like passing yeah. because you haven't had any food all day. Right. But realizing that that is we have literally drilled that into our brain that if we punish ourselves and deprive ourselves at the beginning mm -hmm. and can feed ourselves on nothing, if we can go 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 just on adrenaline, then then we can reward ourselves with whatever it is, the, mm -hmm. the chocolate cake, the, mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, the, mm -hmm. the wine and the beer. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting thing to be on, on the other side of it now. And for me, it's, I just want to feed people the food that they right. can eat. Right. Right. But it tastes really good. And it's, I, there's still a, a hard time with that. People will eat my food and go, well, there's no way this is okay <clears throat> for me to eat. Like, there's no way. Like, there's still that if it tastes really, really good, there must be something wrong with it. So that's been that. We that haven't quite gotten, on. yeah, we haven't quite gotten uh, to that part yet. So. so let's talk a little bit about that then, because um, a lot of people come to me or come to my website and it's, should I do a structure plan? Should I do intuitive eating? What about this? When can I eat? You know, yeah. and, and, and there's so much confusion. You know, so much bless confusion. their hearts, you know, so much confusion and, and you had it, I, you know, we, 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 we've had it. What, what would you say is, what does it sound like for a normal eater? And maybe there's a couple of distinctions, you know, maybe on a more athletic person or something yeah. more sedentary or a senior person versus, a, yeah. but how would you define like normal eating behavior? What should they, how, how would you go about explaining that? I would say that whatever you're choosing to eat before you put it into your mouth is asking the question, does this bring me nourishment and joy? Mm. Food isn't supposed to bring you guilt. Mm. It's not supposed to bring you deprivation. Mm. So if you say, I'm going to eat this and I'm going to have to go work out more later because I'm eating it, mm. rethink what you're putting in your mouth. Right. Um, I know that this is not necessarily the best thing for me to be eating, but I'm just starving right now. Mm. And when I hear people say that, I always remind them of the same thing, then be really grateful for it. Mm. Look at it and say, I'm so grateful that I have, have this something. food, that I have something, that 
that I can eat to be able to sate me yeah. and then let it go. And for me, it's a practice that, um, it's called mindful eating practices. Okay. Um, there are some great uh, videos out there and it takes the notions of mindfulness into your eating practice. So what are mm -hmm. 12 steps to, to being mindful while you eat? Mm -hmm. Can you eat sitting down? Can you eat by that numbing and that savoring? Mm -hmm. Can you really enjoy what you're eating or mm -hmm. is it just not that enjoyable because it's that dry rice cracker and you know what I mean? Like, like someone says it's a new thing. Yeah. Right. Can you enjoy it so much that you, that you know when you're done with it, right? That you're not, that you're not just trying to get it down as quickly as, and mm -hmm. as fast. For us, it, when I became a mom, it really had to transform the way that I fed my kids. I, I don't feed them in the car. Mm -hmm. um, if we're on long road trips, we pull over and we do a picnic on the side of the road. Okay. If I pick them up from school and know that they have school activities, I don't shove food in their mouth in the car. We throw a blanket out in front of the school and we eat before we move on to the next thing. We, mm. It's learning that food was about community. Mm. Food was about about us coming together as a village mm. and a tribe and, and enjoying it. Right. Um, it. It's less saying that you need this many calories and you need this much function and saying, can you sit with your food and be mindful of its purpose? Right. Um, and it's it's not a necessarily easy task, mm -hmm. um, but we do a lot of training in um, how to make sauces, you know, how to dip and how to, to wrap. There's certain things that we instinctually do as humans that we love. We love to dip and we love to wrap and we love to roll things yeah. and have you engage with that food again. Nice. So that you're, you know, you know, as you were talking, something that came to me is, um, you know, in the work that I do, there's a lot of putting, people put themselves last, right? Mm -hmm. So it's reprioritizing yourself. It's putting, you know, like self-love. It's let me put my mask on myself first before I try and help other people. Let me take care of myself. And I, I think if there was a second to this, it would be prioritizing food because you've prioritized yourself. You have to. And it's, mm -hmm. it's there's no... You know, we have a really, um, oxytocin is our love and bonding hormone. Mm -hmm. And it, it forms in a couple different ways in humans, but one of those is actually through mastication mm -hmm. and the process of digestion. And I've seen people with such broken relationships with food that I have to remind them that they need to go in the bathtub with lights and candles and music and eat in the bathtub. They've oh. got to re-loop that system oh. of young kids actually like massaging the back of their heads while they eat to re-get that hmm. sense of savoring. Let them use their fingers and feed, or you feed them, right? Like you feed somebody. That way that you can re-loop. We, we don't feel as if somehow we're worth what's been given to us from the universe. Mm. We somehow feel that like, that, that worthiness isn't there. And you know, the idea of sitting at a table by ourselves and enjoying a meal for ourselves or in our own house. Mm -hmm. um, did you saw the movie Eat, Pray, Love? Mm -hmm. So the scene where she's sitting in her negligee eating right. right. Yeah. Right. We don't give ourselves the belief system that we really are allowed without anybody, without taking pictures of it, without posting it to the world, without telling people what we ate, without anything, just, just savoring mm, that food and, mm. and loving that food. Mm. Um, and it's a, it's a really important process that we, you know, we forget. I, I see it in everything from table settings to table yeah. decor, just really honoring. Mm. It just reminded me, I remember having the concept at one point where they said, um, food is sunlight. Hmm. And I was like, wow, food is sunlight. And it's true. It, I mean, it's a form of that, if you will. It's like the sun's energy creates the, the, new, you know, the food that we eat. Yeah. And I think about what you just said, and it's like, food is part of us. Like literally, it literally, becomes a yeah. part. It forms us. You know, I mean, you know, you've got your cells and stuff like that. But if you take food out of the equation, yeah, we go away. Right. I mean, energetically, um, food vibrates at different levels based on what you're eating and our ability then to use that energy. It's a it's an amazing relationship. I mean, mm -hmm. it literally is. You relate with the food to be mm -hmm. used, and we now know that it's even more intense than that because our body is. 89% composed of beneficial bacteria. Mm -hmm. And those are living organisms with, uh, within us that need and require certain nutrients in order mm -hmm. to function. And so our hormones are like, it's pretty impressive. I always hear people talk about wind and air and fire. And I laughingly believe that beneficial bacteria is actually the true sixth element. Right. And that we forget that we have these living organisms within us and that we're not just supporting us. It's mm -hmm. symbiotic. Mm -hmm. It's 
it's a it's a relationship and when we don't treat it correctly yeah. we get sick and we get ill mm -hmm. and when we look at the fact that gut you know gut microbiome and all the importance of what's in our gut and our enzymes it's what allows us to fully express mm -hmm. health and wellness mm -hmm. and that's why people get ill and that's why they get sick and that's why their hair falls out or they get mm -hmm. yeast infections or they get it's because they don't they're out of balance right and that we have the ability to rebalance that based on what we're choosing to eat mm -hmm. and it's it's a uh, it requires you to believe that your body and your function and you as a human here have so much that you could express and you have mm -hmm. so much power mm -hmm. and that for a lot of people when that's been stripped from them is very difficult to say I'm eating this because I'm gonna do something amazing today with it. And and the restricting is like restricting that you're worthy, you know, yeah. restricting that, you know, you're taking, and gosh, we could do a whole video, and I think coming out of this, an, a whole nother series about the gut, and yeah. I mean, I've only tapped into that in the past year or two, and how fast, how much there is we can talk about just that, right? Yeah. Um, let me see, I've got, I had prepared some questions and I haven't even been looking at them, so let's see if there's, um, <clears throat> what do normal eaters' thoughts sound like? How do they... Yum. <laughs> I mean, it's fun. I see my kids, and the kids are very normal, and they're like, oh, it's so good, it's so good, and, and I hear them go, okay, and I'm done. Mm. You know, it's a... There is no doubt, there's no argument, there's no... Right. no it's, I shouldn't have any more. I right. shouldn't have any more, or, or, ooh, that might make me get fat. It's mm -hmm. just... Oh my gosh, that's so yummy and that's delicious and I love that and I, I think I'm good. Like I'm good, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's normal relationships in a household with food is not saying, "Are you sure you ate everything?" Mm -hmm. Like, didn't look like you ate a lot, mm -hmm. or "Whoa, you're eating a whole lot." Those questions don't happen. It's just allowing the bo their body to to regulate, to self regulate. Uh, um, wow. And it's wow. it's the it's the the normal relationships with food the normal eaters I, I always look at my my kids and my husband in re reference to it is is oh man I totally feel like I want to go for a run now you know is that they eat it and because they're like they're energized they're energized right it's not a oh I'm gonna sit back on the sofa and like oh. watch TV like you watch you watch them begin to use it for something and it's 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 really it's amazing actually That's and you awesome. you know and it, I've never I've never had them go oh you know we, we used to say in preschool um, training is you never yuck anybody else's yum hmm. right so if somebody really loves something you're not like oh that's so weird why do you like that and it's so interesting because I've never seen my children do that instead they're like wow that's kind of cool that's interesting what does that taste like there's curiosity hmm. like normal eaters are very curious about hmm. what they're consuming and what they're doing with it so okay. wow, wow wow awesome let me ask you so if you had someone come to you and they're maybe not the severe case but there's clearly some disordered thoughts maybe they're anti-carbohydrates or <clears throat> they're raw only or you know yeah. maybe they've got some not even strange rules but society would say well that's normal you know yeah. carbohydrates are bad or don't eat yeah. butter or whatever you yeah know? <laughs> so or, or how with sugar so how would you begin to what would you give them as advice for them to kind of start their own journey to, to healing their their beliefs their thoughts their relationship and it's that's where i delve so much right now yeah. um it's it's amazing how how much i deal with that on a daily basis um and it definitely makes me have to reloop my all right let's 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 deal with <laughs> the sphere right here what the sphere is and yeah. it's interesting because it's the constant reminding them that food serves a purpose to guide you and to heal you, not to create harm. Mm -hmm. And if something like bread has been around since 10,000 BC, and all of a sudden we are so anti-bread and we feel that bread is so bad for us, mm -hmm. let's look at the stories behind it. Mm -hmm. And it does require a neutral voice to say, where bread devolved over the last 75 years is very different from where it evolved over the last 8,000 years. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can go back to it this way and mm -hmm. understand why we could have gone this long without having a problem mm -hmm. and what happened here. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it literally requires us to dismantle the myths mm -hmm. and to say, this is why we started hating fat. This is why, right. and we see it in that the 75 to 150 year realm. We really see right. it strong. And it's, it happens to be the invention of, of food science as well. Right. And going, right. you know what? Like, ironically, our healthiest time in our nation was actually during the Victorian era. Mm -hmm. Like it's 
it's coming through and there's, you know, it's, it's even if it's the paleo diet and, and demystifying, demystifying these great ideas and saying, let's really talk about what this looks like and what this means. So a lot of times it's me asking questions back. It's not mm. saying this is, it's, does that feel right? Mm. Does it feel good? Well, I don't know if it feels good. It just feels like what I'm supposed to do. Mm. Do you enjoy it? Well, no. I mean, who enjoys drinking that every single day? So it's, it's asking that. Yeah. So it's asking those questions like, how's that working for you? And, and we say in our um, household, you know, keep on doing what you've always done if you want to keep on getting what you've always got. Mm -hmm. So if it's working for you, mm -hmm. good. Yeah. But if every two weeks you're cycling through some new program, right. then it's not working for you. Right. Or if you're, you know, if you fi I find that normal eating behavior and patterns in people, they don't obsess about food all the time. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the least concern. Right. Like food is not a huge preoccupation it's not something i mean something they plan for yeah. you know but they're not reading diet books and right yeah. right right so i would say if you maybe find yourself with a lot of preoccupation with food first are you getting enough calories good good healthful yeah. calorie you know are you in the restrictive mindset and then maybe some of it is um you know what is the meaning you're giving to your food yeah right like what are you making that food mean what does butter mean what does a carbohydrate mean what does a piece of bread mean yeah right? what does air mean you know, what what and we forget that it's the same function hmm. like what why do we need to breathe and what are we doing with that breath and, and make every exhale worth something and we we don't really think about it you mm -hmm. know unless you get so bad that you become a breath holder which does happen too <laughs> <laughs> I love the idea I'm just really present for my own self of looking at like I like how you said like kind of that mindful pausing when you're eating and I'm kind of having a new relationship as I'm thinking about this from our conversation of like, do I want this to be a part of me? You know, like, is this going to help me thrive? You know, yeah. like, am I going to, you know, if I consume this, will I feel better after or feel worse, worse after, right? And if I feel better about myself, I feel better energetically. Now, granted, you know, as a vegetarian myself, sometimes I find, you know, I'm just, I need something, right? Yeah. Because I'm on the go and, you know, run and there's not as many choices. So, I like how you said, just be thankful for that thing. But yeah. when I can choose and, you know, put things in my fridge or eat foods that you prepare for us and just, this makes me feel better, you know, this yeah. makes me feel better. And, 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 and just gratitude, you know, it's, it's yeah. we, saying grace is something that's happened in cultures and yeah. all over the world for yeah. for thousands and thousands of years. Well, that aligns the vibration of the, the human, I think, yeah. too. I mean, you, you align your own vibration with what you're about to receive. So it's, yeah. it, you know, instead of the coming to it from a busy standpoint or driving in your car, like you're saying, or standing over the sink or whatever, yeah. it's like, yeah, let me just cr create a vibration of thankfulness in yeah. my own body, right? Yeah. And allow you, I think, to assimilate it and receive it better as well. Yeah. Okay, so let's just maybe take a couple more here and we'll, we'll wrap up. So, um, how about a self-image? How does, you know, we talked a lot about like the relationship with food, but how do people who maybe have a, a lower self-image or they get to maybe some body dysmorphia or, um, you know, you talked about in your days of, of training and stuff like that. Like I look at the, the social media and just media in general and how almost extreme it's getting to strength and you know abs and you know all these things <laughs> and it, it's like how do you make sense of this and what what is how do we come up with a, a healthy self-image if you will i think marketing is a is a strong mm -hmm. is a strong force marketing is something that has taken over from food to the six pack to the before and after images mm -hmm. and we always we always talk about it in terms of success. And when I ask people what success means to them, it's it's interesting to hear what words come out. It's, it's monetary, mm -hmm. fame, mm -hmm. or popularity. Um, it's typically recognition, change in body, right? So it's mm -hmm. like either more lean or like someone's been successful based on the change, and that's what we call the before and after. Mm -hmm. So you do look at the news feeds on social media and people are selling their products or selling their services or selling um, selling their blog or their voice based on their supposed success. So saying, well, this made me really wealthy. So if you follow what I do, you'll become really wealthy. And if you're not, then you should feel really bad about yourself because you- Look at me. Look yeah. at me. <laughs> um, look, you know, I, I call it the decapitated photos right now. You don't even see people's faces anymore. You just see from here to here, the torso right. pictures. Right. And it's the before and after. And somehow that before and after is supposed to cue, I want to start doing what they're doing mm -hmm. because look at what happened to mm -hmm. them. And it's interesting because 
that's not the function of the human body. You know, it's, it's, you hear the same stories over and over again about people who have become paralyzed or paraplegic or something tragic has happened to them mm -hmm. and totally revolutionized the way that they've seen mm -hmm. their spirit or their soul or their body. Mm -hmm. But it's so difficult for us because we've linked it with success. Mm -hmm. And that's not what our skeleton is about. That's not what our bones are for. That's not what our muscles are for. Right. The human body has amazing capacity and, and ability to function. Right. And it's about what are you doing with your body, right. not about how your body looks. And it doesn't mean what are you doing with your body, meaning are you running that race or are you winning that award? It means what are you doing in your day-to-day -day life mm -hmm. that's creating self-success, mm -hmm. not... Do you have full functional movement? Yeah. Or you, can you, you do touch your energy? tones without being in pain? Yeah. Can you get up and not be like, oh, something aches? Mm -hmm. um, it is that true moving well. Right. And what is the point and the purpose of it? And it's interesting because um, there's a great book called Brain Rules. And it's about how our brain actually develops in order to um, create more neuropathways. Mm. And one of the ways that they know it does it the most is through movement. Mm. If you're not moving without pain, your brain actually can't create new feedback. It's why we see so much dementia and other things. And it is a much more spiritual concept. But self-worth, again, our exterior has nothing to do with anything. Right. It's right. what we can put out into that world and what we can achieve and what we can do. And it's, it's I, I sometimes just wish I could throw all that like protect everybody away from those right. images or those false or the marketing. number on a scale or something you know like, yeah I mean if I could think about all the people who, who cumulative the number of years that they spent not good enough because they were five pounds ten pounds away from some target weight and the lost and years of joy and yeah yeah for for what yeah for, for not right? yeah for and, not and it's and you, you you know I, I come into contact with people later in life you know like near the end of their life and the things that they talk about or things that are important to them are not, you know, like, oh, do I look fat right they now? They get into those genes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and it's such a preoccupation, right? And I think when we can transform and, you know, I think a lot of, I think inner success or inner mastery is not necessarily listening to what's on the outside and letting that dominate your conversation or letting that guide what your happiness is, your, your definitions of success or vitality or fulfillment where a marketing person says, oh, eat this, drink this, wear this, buy this, drive this, date this person, you know, whatever. Yeah. And then that, that's the definition of happiness. And we don't often spend enough time inside defining it for ourselves. And I think, like you said, you know, someone who's maybe in their 70s or 80s, yeah, maybe they don't need the same amount of energy calorically to be doing the same things as someone who's in their teens or 20s or very athletic or, or, or whatnot. And so defining what vitality and what your body's purpose or movement you you need it to do right yeah. I mean you have long days of running out with kids and businesses to run and, and all this stuff like your your energy need is is great whereas maybe people who uh, work in an office you know, yeah have a lot of mental calories but maybe not as many yeah. physical but they're physical demands too yeah you know? uh, absolutely and that we forget that one of the functions of that body of this exterior is for communication is mm -hmm. for play is for relating moving our soul around the planet <laughs> yeah and it's it's interesting because you know I have two kids who are dancers and never in their life have they ever looked at their physical form about do I have muscle do I like right. there's that doesn't even enter into their brain it's about how does my body move in mm -hmm. space can I do the can jump I leap? that can I, I want? jump can right. I turn can I bend it's about can I do this for a number of hours yeah it's about the appreciation of the dy dynamics of the right. body and then how does that body engage with those other people? And I, I, I'm sure you've touched on it in a video, but we see that with humans who were attracted to. Mm -hmm. It oftentimes has nothing to do with their physical form. Mm -hmm. It has to do with this presence that they bring into a room right. with their body. It's that, it's that how they use their that beam, form, it's their being in yeah. space. Mm -hmm. I wish we could market that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you could just explain to people that when you see those right. gorgeous dancers on stage, right. you are not looking at their six pack. You're right. looking at how they move in space and time. Um, and we're not criticizing one star next to the other star because one is more ripped than the other one. You right? know, and I think people, um, I've experienced anyway, people, when, when I come into contact with people, I say, God, I love your energy. You know, like it's yeah. just, it's something else, right? And the people I think that we're most often inspired by or connected with, it's not 
you know, anything on the outside. It's like you feel something different from them, right? Yeah. Because I would say that they're thriving from the inside, like yeah. you talk about. And maybe the expression of it is their beautiful um, art or their, their dance or something yeah. like that. But it's from the outside in, they're, they're, they're whole and nourished. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What are you using your smile for, your hands for, your body for, your legs for? What are you using right. it for? And it's, it's, again, it's not easy. I can't say that I don't still every once in a while look at those traps and think, like right yeah like you're like oh that's... skinny jeans oh that's yeah kind of fun yeah yeah, yeah. Like, oh. and then you're like you're like what like what like yeah it's, it's an interesting it's a um it's an everyday conversation yeah that you have to have and, and i'm so glad you you touched on that and let's maybe wrap this up because i think a lot of while we've had a lot of conversation it's all about story mm -hmm. right and i do a lot of videos helping people understand the story that they're telling themselves that they speak out into the world the story that they're let's say ingesting from marketing that they're hearing from other people that they're believing from parents loved ones maybe inherited conversations from their past but then what's the conversation they're having with themselves and it's in relationship to food as well so consider you know what the conversation you're having in your your own your own being with other people in your relationship to food and your self-image all of that and maybe just one final any final thoughts um i always love to end my videos with like Ask them to do one thing. Like, what's one thing that they can take away from this um, that, that you most want to leave people with? You know, something to... I think it's my, my why. Um, mm -hmm. My why is that real food, so food that doesn't come from a box or a package mm -hmm. or from a carton or wrapped in plastic, real food mm -hmm. will always bring you nourishment and joy. Mm -hmm. And it's, there's, no doubt of, there's no doubt about it. If you, if you take that kale and you massage it down with citrus and olive oil... Right it tastes good yes and if it doesn't taste good then you you need to come up with a way to something to else heal. yeah it's something yeah. else you're that not would... hungry is one of the things yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you yeah. gotta you gotta know that if it's real food it will always bring you nourishment and joy and if you question either of those then it's probably not real food mm -hmm. there's another symptom there yeah right. yeah virginia thank you so yeah, you're much welcome. Thank fan you. fantastic so I hope you got something out of this video and, and, and hearing our conversation. And I know we're going to have more of these. This has been fantastic. I want to I just, I want to talk all about the gut in another one. So what's one thing that you can take away from this and put into your life? Was there one thing that Virginia said or that I said that maybe if you start thinking about that and how that could transform your life? Is it something that you're thinking about? Is it a way that you're behaving? What's one thing? And go do that thing. Thank you for listening.